Hello and welcome back to the channel. You know, I've gotten some questions lately about my audio system. I talk about music and I talk about recordings. People have asked me, what do you use? What do you listen to? Well, let's take a look. Here is a tour of my audio room. Now, this is the smallest room in the house. It's listed as a 10 by 8, but I think it might be a little bit smaller than that. I tend to choose small rooms for listening rooms. I don't know why, it's just what I've always done. Now I'll point out the most important and the best audio component in this entire room. Just outside the frame here, on this side, is a Zeiler 114 upright piano from Germany. Now I wasn't looking to buy a piano at the time, but I've had this thing for about 20 years ago, and back then I saw this sitting in a piano showroom, and I knew what it was, and they weren't asking nearly enough money for it. I called my piano technician friend and had him look at it, he inspected it and said, I don't know why they're not asking more money for that. I think they just want to get rid of it. You need to buy that piano. So that's here, and it's part of the music room. Now, the reason I point that out is because the upper registers of the piano are undamped. Those are tuned to notes, at least you hope they are, and they will have a tendency to sing along with whatever else is going on in the room. Subjectively, this will have the effect of rounding out and filling out the sound. Having said that, I think the effect of that is pretty mild. So I do have pianists coming over here and I'll have them play, and I will sometimes record them playing. And as you can see, I have some pro audio equipment around here. Uh, here's some recording equipment, and the microphones that I use are usually the Neumann KM-184s. Got some monitoring equipment here, and this is the most easily recommendable audio component of all time. It's also very inexpensive. A pair of Grado SR60 headphones. Still, even today, around $100 US. This is the single best investment I think anybody could make in audio. Everybody should have a pair of these. While we're over here, I do have an audio recording interface, a pair of Sennheiser HD414 vintage headphones. Those were some of my favorite headphones when I was growing up, and I'm glad to have gotten a nice looking pair in good condition that I can use from time to time. These are a pair of original Robin Marshall designed Epos ES11 speakers. These are the ones made in Britain, not the later versions made in China. Now, although I do have the Epos ES11s, the speakers I listen to well over 90% of the time are these Magnapan 1.6 QRs. This model has been discontinued by Magnapan, but it's been replaced by either the 0.7 or the 1.7, depending on which side of the fence you want to fall on. So I think Stereophile a long time ago did a survey as to which brands people purchase who read that magazine, and I'm pretty sure Magnapan came in at or near the very top of that list. It's not hard to see why. These have outstanding value for the money. So before you go out and buy a pair of Magnapans, there are usually three criticisms leveled against this brand, and I'll go through them. They are... Number one, they are relatively insensitive, and they are a difficult load to drive. Secondly, that they are very placement sensitive. And third, that they don't have any base. So I'll address those concerns, at least partially, by not addressing them. I think all of those things are true, to some extent. And not only that, I'm going to add a fourth one. I think Magnapan speakers are too bright. Every pair that I've heard from that brand, they're a little bit too bright. And it's even worse when you're in a small room like this, when you're in the near field, that high frequency driver is going to have a tendency to beam at you and be a little bit too bright. And you know that Magnapan knows there's a problem because they'll often give you a big resistor that you could put in there to tame that high frequency driver. I almost always wind up using that. Okay, so if they've got all these problems, why do I use these speakers? Well, you really have to hear them to understand why. They have a coherency, a transparency, and an ability to disappear in the room like no other speakers that I've ever heard. Turn these things on, and very often you can't tell where the sound is coming from. They seem to energize the entire room with music, and that's what happens with live music as well. These are unparalleled in the reproduction of the human voice. Any kind of singer of any kind feels like they're sitting right in the room with you. Now, to address some of those concerns, 
yes, I think the most important one is this issue of the amplifier sensitivity. They are a difficult load to drive, and these, I'll tell you, they don't like solid state amplification. <laughs> if you've noticed around here, I've got a lot of tube amps, you know, lying around. There, there's a good reason for that. Even on good solid state amplifiers, the sound tends to get harsh and glaring and a little bit hard. Put tubes on it, it tends to soften it up. Maybe there's a solid state amp out there that works with these. I haven't found it. So as far as the placement goes, yes, they are very placement sensitive. But to counter that argument, all speakers are placement sensitive. If you have a pair of mini monitors, like the EPOSes, you've got to put them on stands, you've got to get them out into the room, away from the walls. These things are placement sensitive, but I don't know as if they're much more so than any other kind of speakers. And as an example, I do have a pair of Magnapan MMG home theater speakers set up in a 5.1 system in another room. Those speakers hang up against the wall. That's the one thing you're never supposed to do with a speaker, and they sound fine. As far as the lack of bass goes, yes, they do lack bass. These are a little bit better than some of the earlier models they had, but if you really want to feel room-shaking bass, these are not the speakers for you. Me, I'm not a real bass fiend. I don't really care so much about that. I have seen people try to pair these things with a subwoofer. You know, I have mixed feelings about that. I don't know as if I've really heard a great subwoofer integration with a lot of speakers, let alone these. It's a different kind of speaker. The tone quality is going to be different. And it may be impressive at first because you're hearing and feeling that last octave for the first time if you've only listened to these. Well, you know, after a while, you're going to start to notice. So as far as the ability to disappear in the room goes, if you've only listened to speakers in boxes before, you really do need to hear these because any speaker that's in a box is going to have that hooded boxy coloration to it. It may not be obvious until you listen to a pair of these and this, you'll notice that the boxiness goes away. And of course it goes away because there is no box. This is just a dipole suspended out in space. So as far as amplification goes, I have this KN A50T integrated tube amplifier. It's rated for 35 watts a channel, and it's a class AB amp. But this one has a nice little secret. In the remote control, you can switch between ultralinear and triode mode, and you can do it on the fly. So if you're a geek, you could sit here and press this button all you want and geek out over which mode you like better. Of course, any card carrying audiophile always likes triode mode better. And when I've had people in here, even novices, and when they're switching back and forth, I think most of them that I've shown this to will say that they prefer triode mode. It tends to sound, in their words, a little richer, a little fuller, and it seems to have more harmonics on it. Also, it subjectively does appear to be a little bit louder, which is counterintuitive because once you switch this into triode mode, the power goes down from 35 watts a channel down to 16 watts a channel. And I'll tell you, I think that number may be inflated. I don't think it has nearly that much wattage on the output. This exacerbates the problem, unfortunately, of the magnapans being relatively insensitive. But I don't really listen at high volume levels. In fact, when I've had audio buddies over here, one of the most common things they ask me when I start playing music for them is, you really listen at that level? <laughs> yeah, I do. My other amplifier here is a solid state amp. It is an NAD 316 BEE. That is, of course, a budget audiophile favorite. It's rated at 40 watts per channel, but if you know NAD's equipment, they tend to conservatively estimate their power outputs. This thing plays like a lot more than 40 watts per channel. The digital source is a compact disc player from Cambridge Audio. I don't really find a lot of differences in CD players. I just sort of bought something that was in my price range. For the analog source, I have one of the original Project Debut 3 turntables with the pre-installed Odofon cartridge. Now that cartridge I will sometimes swap out for a couple of Grados that I have around here. I think the sound is pretty similar, at least to my ears. Now if there's one component that probably could be upgraded, it is this analog end. I do want to start using moving coil cartridges, and the Project 
phono stage that I have that I'm using does have a moving coil input. So here's the system with the EPOSes in place. The changeover didn't take very long, but I had forgotten just how much those MagnaPans weigh. The pair of them are 92 pounds, a little bit hard to grip them, but I got it done. After playing with placement, I found that the EPOSes sounded best in approximately the same position as the MagnaPans were, towed in slightly towards the listener. Now, unlike the MagnaPans, which kind of need the tube amplification, the EPOSes being a small ported two-way will run on almost anything. So I've got it on the NAD amplifier, and in fact, I've run these things off of mass market receivers. They sound just fine. They have a six and a half inch woofer and a small tweeter. This is a minimalist design. The crossover is nothing more than a capacitor in series with the tweeter itself, and there are said to be metal rods inside to brace the enclosure so that it doesn't flex or sing. Now, having said that, I can still hear some of that boxy hooded coloration that I talked about before because it's a speaker in a box. The sound is different. It's a more complex, richer, fuller sound, and despite having a relatively small bass driver, the bass is subjectively much stronger than it is on the MagnaPans. The only part of this speaker I don't like, they are bywire banana plug only. I have no idea who dreamed that up. You've either got to buy a special set of speaker cables or make them yourself. Actually, I shouldn't complain. The speaker terminals on the MagnaPans are really bad also, but sometimes we forgive that because the MagnaPans are quirky to begin with. So those of you who know this kind of equipment, if you're in this kind of world, you'll notice I didn't go crazy here. This might be described as the low end of the high end, and I did that on purpose. The total retail value of everything that you see here is well under $5,000, and I didn't even pay that. I get my stuff used. I think that if I were to save up enough money to buy a really first-rate piece of audio equipment, I'd probably get another piano instead. So those are my biases. I take precedence with live music over recorded music. So there you have it, a look at my audio system. Hope you found this interesting. I'm interested to see what you listen to. What do you have in your audio system? And I'm especially interested if you've had an expensive, highly rated system that you didn't like. I've had those too. So I look forward to reading your comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.